Uh, morning. I was almost said afternoon. Still the morning. Um, yeah, I'm Lee. I'm the site manager for the RSPB at Horsewater. Um, and it still feels a bit uncomfortable saying it, but I, apparently I'm also an author as well. Um, and I've written a book called Wild Fell. Um, so yeah, the talk will be about uh, the work that we're doing up at Horsewater, which is also the story uh, about of, of, of the book, effectively. So um, most of you will know, I'm sure, that Horsewater is uh, tucked up against the eastern edge of the Lake District. I'm going to have to describe these, aren't I? Because you can't really see them, but anyway. Um, and there is a beautiful view on the screen there, and you'll have to take my word for it. And it's a view that makes me feel a whole range of different things, really. So um, if I stand up on this ridge, which is a uh, long style, looking out over the top, the northwest corner of Rigendale, um, it's, a, it's a view that kind of you know, moves me as much as any one of the other 20 million or so visitors that come to the Lake District every year. Um, but it's also a view that kind of makes me feel a whole range of other things, because that's effectively my office, so it makes me feel a huge sense of um, good fortune, I suppose, that I get to be able to kind of work in a place like that. It's a view that makes me feel a huge sense of responsibility too, because pretty much everything that you can see in that, in that uh, landscape there is um, part of the land that we're looking after at Horsewater. So we've taken on the tenancy of two farms, Naddle and Swindale. Um, Naddle is a really well wooded um, valley over the, the, the sort of the, um, the eastern side of the reservoir, all that woodland that you drive through as you head down to the car park at the end of Mardale. Um, and then Swindale is the next valley over. And associated with those two farms are about um, 2,000 hectares of common grazing land as well. So all of that high ground that, that circles all the way around the end of the reservoir is, is, is under our kind of management control, if you like. So looking at that and knowing that the decisions that my colleagues and I are making and the work that we're doing will have an effect on how kind of wildlife fares across that whole vista is um, you know something that we take very very seriously and is is you know that's why we're there that's what motivates us to keep going, but it's also a view that makes me feel a little bit sad because the longer that I've been at Horsewater, the more I've kind of understood about the area's ecological history, the more I've realised just how much is missing, uh, and I'm sure lots of you will will know all about that as well. I mean, it is largely, apart from that slope, a largely treeless landscape, um, and you know ecologically speaking, that's not necessarily how it might be otherwise. If I'd stood in uh, the same spots seven or eight years ago, there's the possibility that I might have caught sight of England's very last golden eagle. Um, so the RSPB are at Horswater because of golden eagles. They came back in 1969 after an absence of 170 years. They were absent across the whole of England for 170 years. Um, and their numbers had started to build up in the Scottish borders as a result of um, new forestry plantations going in. So when forestry plantations are young, they provide really quite good feeding opportunities, hunting opportunities for golden eagles. And then as they start to close, they become less favorable. So this population of eagles had taken advantage of those new forestry blocks. Uh, the numbers had built up. And then as the forestry started to close again, they were sort of pushed out into the wider area. And as far as golden eagles are concerned, the Lake District is the Scottish borders. You know, they, they obviously don't see the national divide. It's no distance for them to fly. So um, a pair made a nest on Harter Fell, which is the, the sort of the big crag that overlooks the car park at the end of the reservoir there. Um, but probably because of the proximity to the car park, it was a little bit too busy for them. And more so than, than really any other bird, golden eagles just don't like people very much. They're very intolerant to disturbance. So they laid eggs in that first nest, but they abandoned them. Um, and they moved around the corner into Rigendale, which is a little quieter. Um, and that was a territory that they were to hold for the next 45 years. Um, so there were five birds over that 45 year period. There were um, three males and two females. And as one half of the pair died, another would drift down from Scotland to take its place. Golden Eagles established territories and they hold them for their entire lives. Um, and during that period, they produced about, uh, they produced 16 chicks successfully that, that, that went off to live their lives in places unknown. Um, the third male in that little group was a bit of a tragic character. He was mated with the second female. Uh, for the last few years of her life. Um, she was the oldest known um, living wild golden eagle. She lived to 30 years. Uh, and he was paired with her just for the last couple of years before she died. And at that point, the population in Scotland had dwindled so much that there weren't enough birds in the vicinity. So he was left by himself completely for the next 12 years. And every year he would display, they have this amazing kind of undulating display flight showing off you know, how fit I am, what fantastic territory I've got. 
But because there weren't enough birds in the local area, he never managed to, to pull in a mate. So after 12 years all by himself during the winter of Storm Desmond, uh, we think he probably died of old age. Combination of being 20 years old, which is the sort of average lifespan for a golden eagle, the fact that it was really extreme weather over that winter period probably made it really difficult for him to hunt. Um, and he was probably, you know, a bit depressed, hadn't had a, hadn't got his end away for 12 years. So, um, um, and that was the end of eagles uh, in the whole of England again. Um, and the fact that the whole of the English countryside is incapable of supporting even a single golden eagle is a pretty damning indictment of how we've been looking after the place. And there's lots of other things missing as well. Um, you know, it doesn't take long before you look across a Lake District Ordnance Survey map that you'll see lots of eagle crags, actually. Some of those relate to white-tailed eagles as well as golden eagles. So if you come across a heron crag or an iron crag or an urn crag, those are all derivations of urn, the irons and the, the herons, um, which is the, the uh, Middle English word for white-tailed eagle. And actually, there's lots of those across the lake. So there were probably lots more white-tailed eagles than there were golden eagles historically. And they're much more tolerant of people. Like their, their population that's now growing in Scotland, you know, you'll see them roosting on people's roofs and things. They can coexist with people actually quite a lot more comfortably than golden eagles can. And you'll come across lots of uh, mark crags, pine martins, which have gone. Cat, kit crags is wildcat places. Um, black grouse have disappeared. Uh, this building is a wolf place. This is called High, Lo High Loop, L-O-U-P, as in lupine. Um, and there's also lots of wolf crags um, and whelp sides that relates to wolves as well. So, you know, all of these places that have been sort of stamped on the map tell a story of just how much has changed over time. Um, these cottages, I think, are quite interesting in, in telling the story of how we used to coexist with these wild creatures. This was with that name, Loop. This is almost certainly a building that people lived in in order to protect their livestock um, from wolves that would have been present there um, until around about the 1300s. Possibly not this exact building, um, but in the sort of bracken scattered around this, there are the remains of older buildings that were probably used in that way and then had their stones recycled. But you know, the fact that there's an internal division in here and door openings and windows, this was definitely a place that people lived probably for the summer months. And that kind of um, close shepherding has really disappeared from the Lake District now. You know, it was, it was that practice that is still practiced in, in the Alps and lots of other places where people move up with their livestock, spend time with them. Um, that's, that's where the sort of the whole hefting practice and that transhumance had its origins. But without those big animals, that's largely died away and been replaced with something a bit different. So the black grouse are probably the most recent departure from the Lake District's cast of missing species. Um, they were present in the Horswater, Long Sleddle, um, Kentmere area up until as recently as the 1980s. Um, and as I'm sure many of you know, black grouse are a kind of more woodland grouse than the, 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 the red grouse. Red grouse are dependent really just on heather moorland. Black grouse need young woodland as well as heathland. They need bog, they need areas of grass. And so they need that whole intact habitat mosaic, of which we've got all the bits of still, but they're very, um, very much reduced and fragmented from each other. So, um, you know, if we could get black grouse back into the Lake District, that would be a sign that things are moving in a really positive direction. Um, and of course, the, you know, these species have disappeared largely because we have changed the habitat so much that they can't really persist anymore. This is a lovely picture that you can't see of um, uh, a hillside full of bracken um, looking across from um, sort of the, the, the road alongside Horsewater across to Bampton Common. Um, and, you know, bracken is not really anybody's favourite plant, I wouldn't have thought. It's a very successful plant, um, but it's an indicator of how much has changed again. So bracken really shows us where trees probably used to grow, certainly shows the places where the soils are suitable for trees to grow. They need, um, bracken needs quite deep, dry-ish soils. So you won't see it growing on the windswept mountain tops where the soils are very thin. You won't see it growing in the bogs. So where you see a kind of great big hillside of bracken, I think it's quite a useful way to sort of reimagine what the landscape might have looked like previously and perhaps how it might look like again. Um, and obviously there's massive debates about where we should be trying to re return trees to the landscape, what method we should be using. Um, and I think in upland areas, the, the place to focus our woodland re-establishment efforts are, you know, most obviously in the bracken, you know, by, by replacing bracken with, with woodland and scrub, 
nobody really is going to lose out. You know, there's no grazing value in, um, in bracken. Actually, a friend of mine, an ecologist, worked out that by planting trees into areas currently dominated by bracken, you'd, you'd be increasing the forage potential for livestock as well in the, in the long run once those trees are established. Um, obviously, it's difficult for access. There's very little wildlife that depends on it. Um, and I've been working a little bit with Guy Shrubsole, who you probably know wrote that Rainforest of, of Britain book, and he's carried out a mapping exercise that suggests there's probably about 12% of the Lake District that's dominated by species-poor monoculture bracken. So, you know, if we, could, if we could get that regenerating into woodland and scrub, that would vastly exceed all the planting targets that the, the, in the Lake District National Park's management plan for, for woodland expansion. Um, so yeah, other signs, you know, other ways of reading the landscape of what's changed, you know, as well as the bracken showing where the trees probably used to be, you might come across snaking depressions in the floodplain where rivers used to run, old kind of withered old hawthorn showing where hedges used to be, um, drains in the peatland, you know, everywhere you look, there's some kind of sign of human activity that has modified this landscape. So when people come to the uplands of, of England, come to the Lake District and describe it as this amazing kind of wild, untouched place, um, you know, it doesn't, doesn't take a lot of effort to, to show that isn't really the case. Um, I'm going to keep going through these slides just because it prompts me to say stuff even though you can't really see them. This is a lovely picture of um, a little wetland area that we've restored up on Mardell Common. Um, and so by reading all of those signs that I've just mentioned about how much has changed, you can, uh, they, they can be useful clues as to, to, to guide restoration. So when we started... Um, at Horswater took and our when we started with our farm tenancies about a decade ago we did as you would expect we did lots of surveying monitoring to work out what wildlife species we had what the conditions of the habitats were but we also looked back at the old maps to see um, you know where where there were um, where there was evidence for, for, for habitat change and in this particular location up on the common um, on the first of the ordnance survey maps from about 1980 there was this little um, sort of tarn a bit like a Scottish lochan a sort of irregular shaped um, water body and it was still there on the sort of 1880 map and 1910 map and then by the 1950s 60s map all of a sudden it disappeared uh, and what had almost certainly happened was that the farmers common grazes up here had taken advantage of grants that were being offered at the time to try to improve the land through drainage um, and they'd simply cut a big drain out the bottom of that water body and, and just let the water away. So working with Cumbria Wildlife Trust a few years ago who were carrying out a wider program of bog restoration, we asked them to um, block that drain up and just go a little bit higher, put in some sort of small barriers and hey presto, um, that little lock and reappeared. Um, and it's a real truism in nature conservation that when you add water back into the landscape, the wildlife just comes pouring back in again and to walk around there now um, you know it's busy with reed buntings and teal use it and dragonflies and sort of tall emergent plants and I suspect we've lost a lot of small water bodies across the Lake District landscape as, as a result of that those drainage attempts perhaps earlier as well people used to drain out wetland areas in order to access the peat deposits underneath in order to, to um, use it for fuel and I was lucky enough to go to Norway on a sabbatical a few years ago and the Norwegian uplands, particularly in the southwest, are climatically pretty similar to here. They have more snow in the winter, but they have a similar level of rainfall. The hills are made of the same geology. Um, the, you know, the wildlife is, is, is really quite similar. I recognise most of the things that I saw there. Um, but what's a very striking difference is there's just so much open water, like all the way across the fell tops. And as a result, you know, there's a lot more wildlife, a much greater abundance of wildlife in the hills. Um, but not everything's been modified. We're really lucky at Horsewater to start out with some really fantastic bits of habitat, um, particularly the woodland areas. So Nadal Forest is designated as a triple SI and special area of conservation um, for its temperate rainforest. So it's probably the second most important block of um, native woodlands in the sort, certainly in the northern part of the Lake District after Borrowdale. Um, it's quite a lot smaller than Borrowdale. We've got sort of 200, 300 hectares of, of really good quality woodland. And that's persisted really through just a quirk of fate. Um, it was a medieval hunting preserve. So people, um, you know, five, six hundred years ago used to, you know, value the tree cover that it gave to, to deer and to other species that would be hunted. Um, and that period of protecting those trees meant that those trees have really persisted all the way through. Um, even though it's been grazed periodically and some, some timber has been removed, um, it suffered a very, you know, it, it's it's 
um, held onto that woodland cover, whereas the other side has suffered a very different fate. So Bampton Common is largely treeless, like most of the upland commons in the Lake District, um, and that's because it's been common grazing land for a very long period of time. So the trees were probably cleared during the Neolithic period, but then the grazing that came after has, has, has prevented any of those from regenerating. So I think this photo is quite interesting in that it shows, um, you know, two very, very contrasting habitat types on land that is effectively exactly the same. Um, and so I would prefer to see more of what we can see on the left hand side, but not everybody feels the same way. And I think that photo shows actually you can have these very contrasting objectives and all landscapes are not just one thing or the other, uh, which is where the debate often seems to be at the moment. It's farming or conservation or rewilding or whatever. And actually, you know, we need coexistence. We need as many different types of, of land management options as we can to get the greatest diversity of wildlife. So the woodlands are really important and we do a lot of work with them. We collect seeds and cuttings, grow things on in the nursery. And the plan is that we can expand that woodland out into other areas of our land, particularly those that are dominated by bracken, um, up above the fell wall, where at the moment they come to a very sort of sudden stop. So the, uh, we've also got some really important fragments of juniper scrub. There's sort of 15 hectares or so of a sort of decent sized block on Mardell Common. Uh, and then there's lots of isolated junipers on the cliffs and crags here and there. Um, and we've been growing juniper in our nursery for, for um, decades, actually. Well before we took on the farm tenancy, we had a small nursery down at Burnbanks. Um, and juniper is obviously really important in its own right, but it's a, an important source of, of food and berries for things like ring oozles and winter thrushes and obviously it has that important cultural value in that it um, flavours gin and venison and all sorts of important things like that. Um, but one of the most surprising fragments of habitat are in some of the most difficult to access places. So up on some of the cliffs and crags, particularly on Heart of Fell and on the cliffs around Blee Water, uh, is the most astonishing diversity of, of alpine plants. Uh, and these are largely not appreciated by most visitors to the Lake District because in order to get up and see them, you've kind of got to put your life in your hands, really. You've got to be quite committed to finding them. But these, this plant community is described as tall herb ledge vegetation in the UK. Uh, but again, in Norway, um, across the Alps, this, the, the, these are alpine meadows, effectively. These want to be growing much more widely than just on these tiny little cliff ledges. Um, and where you exclude the grazing, actually you see those plants being able to spread really, really quite quickly. Um, and being so diverse, uh, they're providing a huge um, range of different invertebrates with, with, with nectar as well. So um, a big focus for the book and a big focus of our work at Horsewater is um, you know, a focus on, on diverse plant life in order to support everything onwards up the food chain. Um, and again, yeah, we're collecting seeds and, and material from these and growing them on in our nursery and helping them to expand out into the wider landscape again. So I think it's fair to say that a little bit like the habitats, the farming traditions in the Lake District um, are also very fragmented. They're also very modified from what they were previously. If we go back 100 years or so, again, 100 years ago or so, um, the farms in the lakes would have been more numerous, they would have been smaller, there would have been more labour available, um, and typically they would have had a much greater range of produce. Um, as well as sheep, most would have had cattle and pigs. Um, there's lots of goose garths marked across the lake district landscape, uh, across the lake district maps. Um, you know, chickens, little orchards with apples and damsons. Because in a remote and sort of difficult to get to place like the Lake District Fells, if you want to have a diverse diet, then you want to, you're going to have to grow as much of that as you possibly can. So there would have been arable plots and root vegetables, um, oats for the, for the ponies for, for working. Um, and that, that was the, the model of farming up here that, that persisted for a really long period of time up until the end of the Second World War. And the subsidies that were introduced after the Second World War to try to boost food production because of concerns about what might happen if another war were to break out and maybe our supply chains would be disrupted, um, saw government money really for the first time pouring into farming across the whole of the UK. And it started in the lowlands, but after a while the up, there was a recognition that the upland farmers were probably going to get left behind if there wasn't the same sort of support. Um, so the payments that came in to do things like land drainage in order to try to kind of boost productivity uh, were pretty important. But the thing that made the real difference was um, the headage payments that came in and farmers were paid per head of livestock um, and any 
economically rational person is therefore going to increase the numbers of livestock that they have. And it's a lot quicker and easier to increase the numbers of sheep that you've got than other livestock types. So that pushed people towards rearing sheep in quite big numbers. Um, and most of the Lake District became kind of quite monocultural, really. Farms were having, carrying sheep and, and not really very much else. And that's the model that's really kind of persisted until quite recently. And I think the farmers like James Rebanks and others are kind of moving back to a more traditional model, incorporating cattle and other grazing animals as well. And that's very much what, what we're trying to do. Um, but because sheep um, were there in such high numbers, because they are not a native grazing animal, so um, cattle, ponies, pigs, all have native ancestors in the UK. Sheep don't, they come from Mesopotamia. And so all of our native ecology is kind of really mismatched with the sheep. And so the way that they graze is they kind of pick out the sweet things from the sward uh, and leave the things that they don't like very much. And that, that's the reason that most of the Lake District fells are dominated by quite a small number of very coarse, unpalatable species. And the more tasty ones and the tree saplings that try to poke their head above ground tend to get zeroed in on by the sheep quite quickly. So that's not to say that sheep are, in, are you know, they're definitely a really important part of the cultural heritage of the landscape. Um, but when they're there in, in very high numbers, they, you know, are unquestionably pretty damaging to our native ecology. So a decade ago, um, we were given this amazing opportunity at Horsewater. We took on these two farms with this, these large areas of common grazing land. With the, uh, with the intention of really trying to tackle all of those issues that I've just talked about um, and trying to find a, a, a sort of a different way of farming um, that still produces livestock, that still respects the cultural heritage and the traditions, but also restores the landscape for, for water because we're on the most important drinking water catchment in the country, but also for wildlife and also uh, in order to benefit people and, and the sort of public goods uh, that people need to come from upland landscapes like ours. Um, and although hopefully that sounds like a good thing to you, um, it's not universally popular. You know, the Lake District is the most popular national park, the most visited national park in the country. Um, and to suggest that maybe it isn't perfect and that maybe there is room for improvement is not necessarily something that everybody wants to hear. Um, and so we've had to do an awful lot of work to try to communicate why we're doing what we're doing and what it's going to look like by the end of it or, you know, as it starts to develop. So we recently had this series of um, visualizations commissioned. Um, and this is the before picture. So this is basically kind of depicting all of those issues I've talked to you about, you know, high levels of grazing on the hill, woodland that stops very abruptly at the fell, fell wall, limited numbers of species on the, on, the, on the common, you know, skylarks, meadow pipits, not a great deal else, lots of deer in the landscape. Um, large areas of monoculture, bracken, a straightened river in Swindale, uh, drains that you can't see in the picture that are uh, cut into some of the blanket bog areas. So a whole range of issues that we are, you know, that we've been working on over the last decade or so. Um, we've got a little video of this that's online on our website, wildhorsewater.co.uk, um, which has a kind of narrated version of this. So, you know, if you're interested, look at this in, uh, you know, being able to actually see it, go and have a look at it um, a bit later on. But um, this is the picture that depicts where I hope the landscape is going to be in something like maybe 50 years time, um, because change obviously happens very, very slowly in the uplands. But broadly speaking, it's a landscape that's got more trees and scrub in it. Um, it's still very clearly a distinctive Lake District landscape. It's still got sheep, albeit in smaller numbers and really grazing just on the enclosed land of the valley bottoms, whereas on the hill we've restored a sort of much more naturalistic grazing regime incorporating cat cattle and ponies as well as a reduced number of deer. Um, the beck in Swindale has got its meanders back, uh, the bog up in Mosedale has had its drains blocked up um, and as a result of that there's a greater diversity of wildlife. We've got you know sniper doing really really well in those restored bog areas, uh, wind chat are starting to take advantage of the expanding woodland edges um, and yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's kind of cropped off the top of that picture there. So, you know, red kites are starting to reappear again. And hopefully we might have golden eagles and maybe even white-tailed eagles back in our skies again before too long. Both of their populations are starting to expand across the country. So these big pictures, I think, are quite useful, but we felt it was also handy to go into more detail. And we, we had a series of these sort of vignettes done. So that's the kind of the before and after of bog restoration. Um, you know, cutting those drains into those peat bog areas was well-intentioned. You know, it was driven by 
us as society, we were asking for sort of increased food production, and that was believed to be a good way of helping to contribute to that. Actually, I'm not sure in the upland peat bogs whether it really did a great deal for boosting food supply, food production. It converted the vegetation from one that was dominated by um, cotton grass and heather and sphagnum to one that's really just become dominated by rushes and coarse grasses generally, which don't really have a lot more feed value than the thing that was there before. So it was well-intentioned, but it had all these negative consequences. It sped the water flow, increasing the risk of flooding for people downstream. Having faster water flow meant that the water would pick up more in the way of carbon and soil, so discoloring the water, causing a problem for um, you know, uh, United Utilities and you know, all of us as, it, it's, as you, know, you use customers. But even more significant than that, by lowering the water table and exposing the peat to the air, um, vast amounts of carbon dioxide were released. So the carbon in the peat was reacting with the oxygen in the air uh, and just you know, venting huge amounts of carbon dioxide all the time. Um, and there's more carbon dioxide lost from the damaged peat bogs in the UK than from all of the transport emissions put together. So it's a really, really high priority to get those drains blocked up as quickly as we can to re-wet that peat and to reduce the risk of flooding for people um, and to restore the, 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 um, the bog habitats, which consist of a whole range of really specialist, important species. And the work to restore it is really straightforward. It's just a case of blocking those drains again, bringing the water table back up. Um, and we've realized the error of our ways fairly quickly there. So that work was carried out in sort of 50s, 60s and 70s. And I've worked with digger drivers who spent the early part of their career doing that and the later part of their career doing that. Um, so I think there is a bit of hope there that we can kind of learn from our mistakes and remedy things. Sorry about that. Let me just turn that off. Um, Yeah, and it's impressive how quickly the wildlife does come back. You know, the dragonflies and the sphagnum mosses and the sundews and all of those bog specialists return once the water table is back up again. A similar pair of images for Swindale. So we started out with a straightened river. Again, straightened for very good reason. People were living and working in that valley um, in a very vulnerable way. You know, they needed to protect their hay meadows in order to uh, ensure their livestock survival through the winter months. So the logic of straightening that river <clears throat> is quite easy to get your head around. Times have changed, society's demands have changed, and actually now what we need much more as the climate starts to change more and more is reduced flood risk, improved water quality, better wildlife habitats. So although the work that we've done to re-meander the river, to put the bends back into it, is basically the opposite of what was done a couple of hundred years ago, the thought process is still pretty much the same. We're still thinking about how we can modify the landscape in order to meet the needs of society, but we're just thinking about those societal needs in a very different way. And I think there is a sort of, I think sometimes we think about cultural heritage in a bit of a wrong-headed way and thinking that it's something that must be fixed and all of the features must be kept in exactly the state that they are at the moment. But actually, in my mind, cultural heritage is a dynamic, constantly evolving process. And if we don't continue to adapt to those changing needs of society, then you know, we're going to have a landscape that's full of completely redundant features and we're unlikely to have viable livelihoods if we don't allow that kind of evolution to continue. So up in uh, the cliffs and crags, by moving away from sheep, which are able to kind of get right up into really remote terrain um, and just having a grazing regime incorporating cattle, ponies, which are you know, much more terrain challenged is the technical term. We're seeing the, uh, the plants that were restricted to those cliffs and crags starting to spill back out into the wider landscape, bringing, you know, massive benefits for invertebrates as, and, and birds and everything on up the food chain. And if we're to restore our habitat mosaic at Hawes Water to its fullest health, we're going to need all the help that we can get. Um, so we're hoping that before too long, pine martins might start to reappear in Cumbria's woodlands. Um, they are here already in very, very low numbers. Um, and there, are, there is some discussion of, of trying to kind of accelerate that recolonization process through a reintroduction. Um, pine martins could be really good news for red squirrels. And that might seem slightly counterintuitive because pine martins you would expect would eat red squirrels and indeed they would um, but not in very great numbers because red squirrels and pine martins have evolved together and red squirrels have a strategy um, to allow them to coexist with pine martins whereby they are small enough 
to escape down very small spindly branches that, that pine martins are too heavy to follow them across. Grey squirrels, on the other hand, which are the main threat to red squirrels, um, are much um, heavier than red squirrels and they feed on the ground much more. So the pine martins, where they move in, they are starting to nail the grey squirrels, giving a benefit to, to the reds. When we took over the two farm tenancies, we basically replaced um, the same sort of numbers of people that were working there previously. So we had two farms that both had kind of two farming couples working on them. When we took them on, we had four members of staff. Today, we've got about 27. Um, and that's people that are working directly at Horsewater, um, as well as on a kind of wider landscape project, trying to, to sort of expand the work that we're doing out onto other land holdings. And the people, including myself, um, you know, we are all... Uh, we're living and working in the local area. We're obviously different to the people that were farming there previously, but you know, our kids are in the schools, we're buying from the local shops. You know, we're every bit as important to the functioning of the local community as anybody else, I would suggest. And the things that we're doing are the traditional jobs. We're looking after the livestock, we're keeping our dry stone walls up, we're you know, laying our hedges periodically, but we're also doing um, various conservation activities, science and research, uh, we have a tree nursery, we're starting to do little kind of tourism ventures with photography hides and accommodation. So there's a much greater diversity of jobs and a much greater number of jobs. Um, and I would suggest a much greater spend in the local economy. We, you know, we try to use local supplies wherever we can. So I'm not trying to suggest that our model is the model for managing land in the Lake District or the uplands of, of, of the UK generally, but it is a model that is delivering for a whole range of different positive outcomes. And I think there is you know, space for other people to kind of learn from what we're doing and maybe pick up bits of it or all of it and apply it to their own land as well. Um, so yeah, hopefully that mostly sounds like a positive thing um, to you. Um, but yeah, it's fair to say that not everybody was thrilled. Um, and I won't go into the detail now, but there's quite a bit in the book about the, the sort of the personal challenges of doing this kind of work. Um, you know, there was lots of resistance from the local farming community, um, from the World Heritage Site Steering Group pushed back at us pretty clearly, described us, described what we were doing as a wart on the World Heritage Site. Um, and yeah, it hasn't been particularly easy. And I think trying to do something differently in a place where, uh, um, you know, tradition is put on a very high pedestal is, is challenging. I'm sure many of you will have your own kind of stories for, for doing similar work with, with forestry and woodland expansion. Um, so um, I, uh, writing the book really is about trying to get the kind of the message of what we're doing out to as wide an audience as possible, but also about telling that personal story because, um, you know, as regardless of what um, the sort of objectors to what we're doing might like, we are kind of part of Horsewater's story now. We are the things that we're doing, the, the trees that we're planting, you know, they're going to be visible, they're going to be a part of that story for people in the future to look back on. Um, and I think that is what that cultural heritage is all about. It's that continuing interaction with the landscape, kind of making a mark on it and making a connection with it. And that's, that's, that's kind of why I decided to uh, write the book, um, which I do have some copies for sale, by the way. Um, so our work at Horsewater is definitely not complete and you know, really land management never is. But what we hope more than anything is that if we do our job right, then maybe one day we're gonna have a landscape that's fit for eagles again in the future. Thank you very much for listening.